My name is Monk Rowe, and we're in, in Manhattan at the International Association of Jazz Educators Conference. And pleased to have Joe Moraney with me this afternoon. Did I pronounce your name good? Yeah, that's pretty okay. good. Okay. In, in Hungary, they do it different, is that right? Yeah. In, in Hungary, it's a very, I wouldn't say it's a common name, but everybody pronounces it oh, correctly. Okay. You know. Murani is the way they say it. Murani. Well, it's, uh, it, in reading about you, it seems like a, an interesting trip from balalaika orchestras to Lenny Tristano to Louis Armstrong to what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Well, they wanted that that balalaika is one of those things, you know. <laughs> yeah, you say something that's uh, offbeat or you know not on, not in the normal events, in the, in the course of normal events, you know, and then it triggers up, you know. Uh, yeah, right. it was sort of like when when I was going to to college, you know, uh, I went to Columbia and Manhattan School of Music. I sort of gigged around. I played with mm -hmm. a actually played with an old-time Italian band, you know, a street band sort of sure. one. We didn't play in the street, but it was in Springfield, Mass, in some ch Catholic church basement, you know. That was an experience, you know. They had no music, these old guys. It was like the equivalent of New Orleans or something, you know what I mean? Really? And then there's balalaika things. They, they, they played standard classical repertoire, and they had the flute, clarinet, oboe, you know. It was like a, the, the balalaikas were like the, 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 the violins and the violas and all that kind of stuff. And, they, they, they play classical stuff and, you know, like Glinka and things like that, Russian-based. And uh, uh, they also played uh, 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 Russian folk song, Kalinka, Kalinka, that sort of stuff, which was ethnic again. It was kind uh -huh. of fun, you know. Well, it's a great mix for your ears to be doing oh, yeah, all that yeah, kind yeah. of but thing, right? I, I love so-called ethnic music, you know. Mm -hmm. I have a, well, used to have a, a, a quite a collection of klezmer stuff. Which I like very much, and, and and there again, the the earlier the better. And the twenties stuff was was, mm -hmm. was just wonderful, you know. The, the new klezmer bands, oh, they're fun and stuff, but it's yeah. not. They don't have the level of anything as, as the, the old timers did. Was music a big part of your household when you were young? Uh, yeah, I think so. My parents were musical. They sang, and I don't. They, they didn't play any instruments, nor nor my mother's family. There were a lot of brothers and sisters. They didn't play anything. But I, I recently learned that my grandfather, my father's father, played violin and guitar, which was a surprise to me. You know, I barely remember him. But but they were always musical, and uh, I always thought that you know Hungarians had a natural affinity for music, like Italians, Irish, something like that. And I, I, in recent years, past twenty years or so, I've gone there a lot, and I find that. I was basing my opinion of Hungarians on my parents and my family. Really? <laughs> they're, they're not, it's like saying all black people have, have rhythm. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very similar. You know. Yeah. So, so, but music was a very important part. And, uh, you know, I'm getting to the age where I've had that thoughts and funny thoughts and I tear up easily, you know. And uh, 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 I'm an emotional being. Of course, we all are. But the other night, uh, there's something about pennies from heaven. Mm. Uh, the, the song came up. And I had this, this recall of, you know, I have a, 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 a two grandkids, uh, George and Charles, and George is seven and Charles is five. And they're musical. I could tell right away, you know, they, they carry a tune and they, they, they hear something. And, and I'm thinking about myself, at, you know, what age did I start with about the music? And uh, so I start playing or considering music or whatever. And I, I, I remembered that that I learned pennies from heaven. Every time it rains, it rains. To this day, I mean, uh, the, the word, I know the words very well, directly connected back to when I was six or seven. And, and so I'm, I, I used to go to the movies on Saturday morning for nickel in those days, you know, in uh, Martin's Ferry, Ohio, Bel Air, Ohio, way far away, like the steel, s steel mills and coal mines and mm -hmm. a lot of uh, immigrant bohunks, you know, and all that kind of stuff, a lot of Polacks and Italian. And uh, so I used to go to the movies. I might have seen it there, and maybe I heard it on the radio. My, pa my parents at that time didn't have a gramophone, so I learned pennies from heaven because I liked it in my ear, you know, yeah. and the words and all. And uh, uh, they used to stand me up. That's the only one I remember. Stand me up on a chair, like seven years old, and I would perform. Do that song. <laughs> you know, so so I, I, I said, gee. I guess I must have a calling, or yeah. I'm not saying a great calling, but uh -huh. it, it must mean something to me, you know. And so, as a kid, <coughs> I was very aware of musicals. I, I heard the Hungarian music, you know, that my, my parents used to go to dances and balls and picnics, and they'd have a gypsy man. Hmm. And uh, that I liked. I mean, I, I just listened. I didn't, I, 
didn't, it didn't occur to me that it was different or funny or anything. I listened. I was just open to it. And I found it. That I, I enjoyed most the bass player. And they had a, like a, a German bow. You know, you put your fingers right in it. You know, oh, it, right. The, the frog, you know, is very, yeah. the, the, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it, well, it, it, it looks like, looks about like that, you know. It comes down and, and they put their fingers in at the end of it. Mm, they really grab yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Zoom, zoom, zoom. And I'd stand in front of them and I just enjoyed that so much. And I'll tell you, there's a funny thing. Uh, you ever have a trombone player named Cuddy Cutshaw? Sure. sure. Uh, uh, I knew Cuddy. I played with him, you know, more than a few times at the Eddie Conlon's in Midtown in the 50s. And somehow we got onto this. And it turns out he was from Eastern PA or something like that. Uh, the, the, I'm, you know, my, my, I was born in Martin's Ferry, which is uh, so that's on the Ohio River, d down from the river from Pittsburgh, 100 miles, and we're not even that. And he was from that area. And he, too, he, although he didn't have a Hungarian background, he, too, loved the gypsy bands and the bass player going zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah. So it, it, was a, it was a funny kind of thing. You would have been uh, pretty young during the Depression. Oh, yeah. Do you have any recollection of that being a particularly hard time for your family or your neighborhood or you yeah two? yeah uh, yeah well you know uh my parents were immigrants mm -hmm. and uh we were poor but i didn't know it my mother was such a handy housekeeper and she cooked and cleaned and baked and you know it was, it was just it was sort of thing and my father was a was a steel worker <coughs> he worked in the steel mill and stuff you know and uh that that was uh, the, i remember that that was the era of, of uh, the, the unions organizing, you know, mm. which is very critical. I mean, today I know labor unions are considered mafia run and all that, but in my estimation, there's a great room in, in America for what la I mean, labor unions and what labor unions do. Mm. And so, oh, I remember I had a friend who uh, was very teary and cry one day, and his, his father had been, been beaten to death by company goons with a baseball bat. You know, because they were going to strike or something like that. So I remember that, and I remember my father was on the left wing, and uh, I remember uh, that he was very well involved in, in in politics in the sense of voting for somebody or campaigning for somebody. You know, and there was a, a famous, uh, well, to me, a famous, a uh, governor Davy, I think it was in the thir I don't know when in the thirties, and there was a lot of campaigning against him. You know, and he had some sort of the Tar Road plan, it was called. And somehow, he had some sort of swindle about tarring, making asphalt roads or I whatever, see. you know. Yeah. So, yes, I have a very strong and vivid memory of, mm. of the Depression. I, to this day, I love, I love uh, old movies made, made in, uh, as contemporary movies in the 30s. And the earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. They're very interesting because they reflect the time and, and I, I, can, I, I get that feeling from them. Yeah, I, you know. Were your parents uh, wanting you to get a trade, a craft that would well, that, make that, a that, nice that life? Well, that develops. Uh, they wanted, I, I was going to take accordion lessons from my father, you know. Not my, not my, a friend of my father's. It's an Italian guy. And I never got to handle an accordion ever. And I took lessons for three or four months. And it was all solfeggio and the grand scale and all that. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm dying to get my hands on something. So that that I don't know what happened. Oh, that you mean you were taking lessons and you never even got to yeah, play one got for a while? Yeah, never even got to. You know, uh -huh. he was. Uh, I, I don't remember if I had solfeggio or singing. Maybe, but mm -hmm. for, but but it was a grand staff and you know, don't re mi fa so la si and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and. Uh, I, 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 I guess I sort of forgot it because uh, I don't know. It, maybe it had some early. And then I was going to take violin lessons. There was a guy named Prague who came from Cleveland. Yeah, I don't think he was a gypsy. He was just sort of a, uh, a very artistic, very yeah, fairly young guy with pale skin and very delicate fingers and was a hell of a violin player. Mm -hmm. And I had like one lesson or something or two lessons. And, and just, you know, he, he just let me hold it and you know things like that. And he stopped coming to Martin's Ferry. I think he, he had like a, tr a route he'd do, you know, oh. come and teach the, the Hungarian community. He'd teach uh -huh. the kids. And then, you know. So he disappeared. So that was that. So, so they wanted a musical education for me. They didn't want me to be a musician, particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, they were good parents. My father wasn't a drunk or, you know, like a respectful, respectable family man. You know, he tried to provide for his family. 
And later on, when I was a teenager, he wanted me to be an electrician. He had a friend that was an you know, electrician in the Union, and he could have gotten me into the Union at age 17 or 18 or whatever like that, which is like guaranteeing you a lifetime mm -hmm. income, you know? Yeah. And I wasn't interested. No, I was interested in music, and that didn't appeal to me, you know? And <laughs> idiots. <laughs> I don't know. I always wondered what, what would have happened had I done it. You know? I think I still would have been musical, yeah. you know? Uh, you know, a musician's life, as we all know, is... Uh, not the most secure. <laughs> <you know. laughs> That's true. So what was the first uh, sort of jazz-related music that caught your ear? Well, this is very interesting. If you're sensitive to music, as I was and am, and hope to be for many more years, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 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 in that environment in Ohio there, in the 30s, there was no TV. Of course, there was radio and records. I was exposed to this Hungarian music, you know, with swings, you know. And Gunther Schuller says, you know, this jazz music swings. Jazz is the only one there. No, no. Oh, no, okay. Hungarian music, or Romanians even, and I talk about swing. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, does, does it have the, you're doing a up no, to no, and no, four? No, 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 but they, no, no. But it has a groove to it. It's just, you, know, you hear it, there's nothing but rhythm going on. Oh. Uh, I, have a, uh, I still have them, some Romanian LPs, you know. Out of sight, and such yeah. such a sense of rhythm, and you know, like odd tempos in seven and five, and you know, well, so anyhow, uh, I was exposed to this Hungarian music, and then uh, I was exposed that was <laughs> the swing era, you know, swing music, the big bands, you know, little yeah. loony that business, and I remember the I used to like little little sophisticated swing, you know that little mm -hmm. do 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 do. I have a vivid memory of walking through a a carnival kind of thing, an outdoor thing with my mother. Later at late at night, maybe we were walking to go home or something, I don't know how, mm -hmm. and over the PA system came that. And I liked that, you know, and I just, yeah. yeah. Years later when I heard it, I said, oh, I, I know that. So, so I was exposed to swing, I was exposed to Hungarian music, and then in that area, they had a, a, a there was a station called WWVA, and, and it was, a, they had the equivalent of Grand Ole Opry. And Saturday, um, Saturday Midnight Jamboree or something, you know, mm -hmm. and they'd have country, country players and uh, fiddles and banjos and stuff, you know. And so I had that influence. So, and you see, what else? Well, country Western. And then, of course, the, the, you know, the Bing Crosby, the, the pop, uh, uh, not swing, but the, 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 the pop. Yeah, the music. Pennies from Heaven type yeah, yeah, songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so so it, it was all around me. And, uh, you know, I wasn't uh, necessarily in a, you know, the cradle of the blues or anything like that. <laughs> but, but that's a funny one. I mean, you hear young black guys, and I have my own ideas about the origin of jazz. I don't think it's black. It, it, it's, it's not a black music. It's an American music. Mm -hmm. And there, there was always white and Irishmen and Italians and stuff there. You know? yeah. And if, if you're black and you want to be proud about, you know, you're black, that's marvelous. That's great. Some mm -hmm. of the greatest were, you know, Joe Oliver, Louis Armstrong, Johnny Dodds. Right. So, but anyhow, what was I saying? Oh, so the, the, um, the Midnight Jamboree and all that kind of music. And as a matter of fact, my, my uh, kids singing, I continued with that, and they had an amateur contest on, uh, on WWVA. And uh, this is really, and I, and I went to the amateur, uh, they had an audition at the amateur mm -hmm. contest. <laughs> and I got down with my mother, and you know, uh, you know, we had no music or anything like that. And uh, it was it was like something from a, like an our gang or something. It like was, our gang. And yeah. there was a row, you know. There was a row of kids with their mothers, you know, all, <laughs> all dressed up, and probably. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there yeah. was a skinny little red-haired girl. You know. <laughs> she, she might have freckles even. She was saying, you know, and she had a violin, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, she came her turn. In the 30s, there was a song called Vini, 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 da 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 da. It's Benny Goodman made a record of it. It was a pop tune. Vinny, 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 Tutsa, Bella, Bella, waiting for me. You wait up, Vinny, Vinny, Vinny. Okay. You never heard of it, huh? It's one I of those. Not that one, no. But, but, but it's in a discography. Benny uh -huh. made a record, others, you know. Okay. Bad thing. And so <laughs> this little girl. <laughs> well, you can fall on the floor. It was, it was, even as a kid, I said, boy, that's pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Scratching on, you know. And yeah. so, so we all did the thing. <coughs> and I made the auditions. Uh -huh. And uh, I sang on the radio twice. Can you imagine? Yeah. Now, I don't remember whether it was 
the, the amateur hour program or whether they put the winning am amateurs on some bigger program, you know. Mm -hmm. But 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 the, 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 sh the strange thing was, uh, uh, what what did I sing and how did I pick it? I happened to pick really? it. Yeah. Well, it was, There's a gold mine in the sky far away. We will find it, you and I, some sweet day. Nick Kenny, have you ever Nick Kenny? No. <coughs> Nick Kenny uh, had a column. He was a columnist in the news or something, and he. He wrote lyrics for oh, songs. Okay. And this is one of his it's a sentimental things. Mm -hmm. Gold mine. Oh, uh, uh, and the other one was there's a gold mine in the sky far away. <laughs> gold mine in the sky. Ah. So I sang them. Did you have an accompanist? Somebody or played. Somebody played. Oh piano no, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they had a piano yeah. player. I guess. I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the company, a company, a comp accompaniment. I wasn't alone. But but you know, I, I think of it. I must have been seven or eight. <laughs> and that's just sort of bizarre. I, yeah. I never, you know, I, I very rarely run through this in my mind and connecting it to later things, you know. So uh, uh, it started then, and then I kept singing, and then my parents left Ohio, and that's not professionally or anything. It's yeah. just amateur. And I have, I have my father. I have father had. I had only one uncle. My my uncle John, and he was very mute. My father was a sort of uh, on the square side, and John was just direct opposite, a hellion. Uh, Women loved him. Very handsome. He looked like Clark Gable, sort mm. of, you know. And he was a dance. He w was with a Hungarian dance company, and he sang and danced professionally. Mm -hmm. And the first time he heard me sing "Pennies from Heaven," he comes up to me and he says, "You know, that thing you sang in there." He said, "That's not in the song." <laughs> I said, well, I just sort of like that. <laughs> I did a little something. You were something. already improvising. <laughs> I, did, yeah. I did a little yeah. something, you know. Uh -huh. But he caught me on it. He said, wow. and, and to myself, I said, well, I don't care what he thinks. I'm, that sounds okay to me. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so, <coughs> but, but uh, so the, he, you know, he was, he was musical, so, you know, so there must have been some musical feeling on my father's side, on the father's side of the family. Time went by. We moved to New York. And... Uh, uh, my mother, I guess, was a showbiz mother in her own way. You'd never figure to think about it. But we came to New York, and she somehow found a studio or something that gave kids vocal lessons. And it was on Broadway, I'm getting to the big time, yeah. <laughs> Broadway, 52nd, 51st, 53rd Street. You go upstairs, you know, and I went up, and there was a woman. And I don't know whether she played the piano or there was a guy that played the piano. And we sang songs. And I remember I had the sheet music for uh, some, you know, Donna, you are the promise, kiss us, ring, that thing, you know, oh, all the things you want. I, I, I sang through that, you know. Uh -huh. So, I mean, uh, isn't that funny? I had to relearn that <laughs> many a time. Yeah, that's a tricky <laughs> tune. Yeah, I mean, it's got very nice change. Yeah. You really got to know I got, I went on the rocks more than once with that. <laughs> yeah, right. I, 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 right. Jimmy, Jimmy Ryan, I mean, right. Bobby Pratt, the wonderful trombone player and piano player, he, he played the hell out of it. And, with Roy Eldridge, you know, and yeah. I, I had to go home and learn yeah. the sucker. <laughs> okay. So you did all the things you are. It does have that uh, getting about halfway through, it's got that. Oh, yeah, kind yeah. Of this where uh, it, goes dee 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 right. it goes somewhere else. It goes somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> are we on the air? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I did that. And uh, I don't remember, you know, particularly performing as performing, but I was taking these lessons. You know, mm -hmm. it was more, about maybe a couple of years of. Once a week or once every two weeks, you know, and I did it, and I, I don't know cost them. I don't know what it cost, but it, you know, they had, they had to pay money, you know. Yeah. And uh, my father was was not a, was, was not making a lot of money. It was depression times, you know, and uh, then my father belonged to a lodge uh, in the Bronx. We lived in the Bronx, and uh, uh, they had a band, a small band, and uh, they were looking for recruits, and so. What was her name? There was a little Eva or Emma, something or other. And um, they, were, they, were, they were Hungarians, you know. And uh, she cornered me and said, what did I want to play? What would I like to join the band? I said, well, uh, she said, what would you like to play? The tuba? The, you know, like uh, she needed the tuba, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that. You know, I said, no. <laughs> I never thought of it. No, yeah. no, no, no. And uh, she said, well, uh, the trumpeter. And she said, clarinet? And, you know, I must have been pretty hip already or something, because I immediately thought of Artie Shaw or Benny Goodman. Yeah. Said, yeah, yeah, the clarinet. Yeah. That's very funny, you know. Yeah. And Woody Herman, I, uh, I, I knew Woody Herman a little, and I told him the story. I said, you're one of the, you're one of the guys. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I told Benny Goodman, too. 
that you're one of the guys responsible for you. Really? <laughs> I, 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 I met Artie Shaw. I knew Artie Shaw a little, you know. I uh, hung out with him so much. I never told him, but, but it, it, I believe in that sort of thing. You've got to tell people, you know. Yes. So, so uh, uh, it was Clarion. And uh, I, there was a, <coughs> her name was List, L-I-S-T. I forget his first name. Mr. List, I call him. Very nice guy. He was sort of like the violin teacher, slight, pale, very musical. I don't know what he played, mm -hmm. but he was he was very good teacher, in that he he taught me fingerings. I mean, to this day, you know, it, the high notes and everything, you know, like really the correct the alternates, you know, and mm -hmm. how to how to get around. As a matter of fact, I remember, this is very funny that I played uh, uh, the Carter's inaugural with the world's greatest jazz band, and. Uh, uh, it was the Duke Ellington band. It wasn't the real band. It was like the band after the band after the band. Yeah. Matter of fact, wh while we're performing for uh, Jimmy Carter, I guess it was, they had a fist fight in the band. Oh, good. <laughs> Duke's band. <laughs> and, and the clarinet player, and I'm, I'm a cousin to Barney Bigard, and you know, God knows what. The clarinet player comes to me the after the thing. He says, how do you finger a high G? <laughs> With this, uh, well, I showed him. You know. Yeah. Well, so anyhow, Mr. Liss was a very good teacher. But... Uh, uh, I went home, and a clarinet cost 25 bucks, and we paid it off like a dollar a week or two dollars uh -huh. a week or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 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 I, I wasn't an instant success with it because I, I w went home when I was going to master this sucker, you know. And I had a younger sister I had. She's passed on. Uh, and she was musical. She danced. She did Hungarian folk dancing. Yeah. Really good. And uh, as a matter of fact, her teacher was the, this old lady was Mrs. Shirley, and her son was Tibor Shirley, who finished the, the Bartok, whatever it is. When, you know, there was a guy, Tibor Shirley finished, finished the Bartok concerto or oh. something. He finished, uh, he, when Bartok died before it was finished, he finished mm. it. And he used to play piano for their dancing. <laughs> I remember yeah. him, you know, I wow. said, you know who that was? <laughs> so, well, anyhow, where was I? Making, How'd you make your first dollar with your clarinet? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, it, this is this is very very deep. So anyhow, I, I may finish the story about my sister. So I, I, I went home with the clarinet and I started to play practice, and she laughed. She said, "You sound like a duck," <laughs> 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 which led me to I, I practiced and I, I and I and then I improved very quickly. I mean, I just you know ate it up, you know. Yeah. So then I was in high school and I played in the high school band. And I would never gone into athletics much, you know, football here and there. You could, you'd make a good football player, you know. Mm. I wanted to play the clarinet. So my first dollar with the, with the clarinet, would you believe, uh, was a gig in Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, and the bass player was Pops Foster. Oh. It was in a bowling alley in Trenton, New Jersey. I think it paid a lot of money, like 35 bucks or something, which is a lot of money. Than whatever a piece? Yeah. That's a lot of money at that time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I um, mean, yeah, when was it? 40, late 40s, 50s. Yeah. What, a, what a 40s, uh, late 40s, I guess. And it was a very funny one because we're at this place and we're, we go down. To, there's a restaurant and the place where the bowling alley or something and we're going to we're gonna have something to eat. And it's Pops Foster. And I, and I knew who he was. I loved him. I respected him. You know, he's a, and uh, he, said, he looks at the menu and says, is this every tub? I said, Pops, what's every tub? Oh. He said, don't you know what that means? I said, no. He said, every tub on its own bottom. Do we pay or does the boss pay? <laughs> and, I said, and then, you know, there's a King Oliver record called Every Tub. Sure, there is. And a Basie uh, record, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and there's, a, there's, I think there's, <coughs> I think I heard, I heard uh, uh, Louis Armstrong say a couple of times, you know, when an ensemble, we start playing, every tub, you know, every, every guy for his, on his own, you know, who's going to improvise. So did he... He meant everybody was paying for their own food. By everybody on his own. Everybody yeah. on his well, own. Every tub means sort of every every tub on its own bottom. Everybody on his own. That's cool. Okay, and then yeah. that can apply to paying, or it can apply to improvising. You know, we're not going to read music and don't play the melody unison. Improvise, Dad. Right. <laughs> That's great. So, I love learning that lingo. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. you know, many things. And I have sort of a, a historical, scientific, not. 
deeply historical, because I love history, it my, was my mm -hmm. favorite subject in school. Uh, but but it's, you know, I, I, I remember the little details. You know, I'm, I'm an encyclopedia of oddball details. I connect one thing to another, and I love that every time thing. Yeah. Especially since it carried all the way through the Louis Armstrong, you know. So anyhow, uh, that was in Trenton. I'm trying to think. It's a guy named Irving Kratka. Played the drums. He started uh, a record label. What was it? That oh, Inner City Records. Yeah, and, and music, music, mi uh, music minus Irv one. Irving Kratka? Yeah. I'll be darned. Music minus yeah, one. Yeah, music know? minus one. That and was my idea. Oh, get out. Oh, it was. It was, yeah. Oh. We were, I started a record company with him, and then, well, it's a too long a story. Uh -huh. but, but I made a list of possible ideas for a small record company that big ones aren't doing so much. And that I'll was one of them. Who, who would have known? I mean, he actually followed it through. Yeah. You know, but it was something a small company could do that bigger ones don't, you know. Yeah. So anyhow, the, the uh, music continues. And... Uh, you know, I I, I'm, I still consider myself a musician. I mean, that's what I've been doing for so for my existence for a long time now. And uh, I am odd in that my generation usually by this time has been playing bebop for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they, they sort of, uh, they came up sort of in the late big band era, you know, played saxophone or something in a, in a big band. And then went on, you know, and then the, the, the lingua franca uh, uh, of the day well, it was bebop, you know. It was, it was yeah, swing, uh, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't that strong. So, but I, I didn't come up that way. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm too, too young to have been part of the scene in the 30s, you know, come up, play in the big bands. And uh, uh, I, I am an old revivalist. You know, after uh, World War II, uh, there, there was the, the you know the moldy figs you know the one the ones right. that were the ones right. that were interested in old records and King Oliver and Jimmy yeah, Morton yeah. and that kind of stuff you know going back to the original uh, that was me I love that uh -huh. and so in high school I belonged to the Brooklyn Tech Jazz Society and uh, we'd bring in records and uh, I, I junk shopped you know that nothing was available in Monk uh, t today it's like. It's like the computer, you know. Yeah. You can get everything, everything. Even the Red Hot Jazz archive, you can go on. You know that? Mm -hmm. You know, there it is. I, I would have killed for those records. You just click them up. Yeah. There was, well, how were you going to get them? How were you going to get them? Did it make it more precious for you? Yes. You know, because, oh, yes. It was, because it was something you had to really aspire to get and figure out how to get and yeah. carry the 78s home and oh, all that oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. And, you know, junk shopping, uh, uh, I remember... I was in Washington, D.C. I, I, I went to the Ar uh, uh, Army Air Corps, which became the Air Force just as I left at band school at Bowling Field. And uh, my uncle, my Uncle John, the musical one, lived there. And uh, his wife was a nurse in uh, St. Elizabeth there or something. And Anacostia is there in that big black neighborhood. And I remember one day I went out. And it was unbelievable. I, I, it was, they were like, like the rarity. They were like treasures. They were like... God, I went out and I found a Johnny Dodd's Paramount record in very good shape, Dixieland Thumpers, and I found a Freddie Keppard record. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and, and that was, it was a gold mine, and New York had been picked out. There were, oh. there, were, there were a lot of big collectors here, you know, and it had been picked out and it was very hard to find anymore. But I did, I even went door to door, you know, like in Black Neighborhood, good afternoon, you know, I'm looking for old records. Have you any old records? No, I'm kidding. Awesome. So, so it That's, was very precious. Yeah. Well, and and you got to play during the, your military service. You, oh yeah, you got to oh yeah, yes. Playing. So so I did. I played in the band, and then uh, mm, uh, then it was like um, I think it was like 1946 or something, and I, I graduated high school, and uh, uh, it was a matter of they sell you know the, uh, when I joined the Air Force, the war was still on. The war didn't technically end until 47 or something by treaty or whatever. So I enlisted in 46, and I'm a veteran of World War II because the war was still on. Mm -hmm. But but I was going to get drafted. They were still drafting. They, yeah. hadn't dra they, they hadn't changed that law. So I, I don't know why. I mean, I was always, I'm never the, I'm, I'm not, the, I'm not a bad businessman, but I'm not a head. I'm not. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and somehow I, got, I forgot the information. I got the information that uh, uh, if you enlisted, for three years, and then you would get the GI Bill. You could go to college, and if you enlisted, then you could be a pick a field, pick of what you wanted to be. So I enlisted, and I wanted to be a bandsman. And I was I was promised that, so I enlisted, 
and uh, I go to the bank. I go to no, be, I go to San Antonio, Texas. For, and even then, I junk shop. I found some records. <laughs> I went over, and, I, and there's a river in San Antonio, and there's a couple of waterfalls. I, I almost went over one of the waterfalls in my khaki outfit and with a row, with a rowboat or something. Oh, really? So, but anyhow, um, and there, this is not talking about career choices, will that be an electrician or not? So, there I am, and they, I took all the exams and stuff. <coughs> and uh, one day, uh, uh, Private Marino, or whatever they call me, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just, you got to go down to headquarters. Uh, well, I didn't, well, I did. You know. As a matter of fact, I, I did do something when they trained us. You know, hip, 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 to the left, right, to the, full, the right oblique, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And okay, so, okay, cigarette break, 15 minutes or something. They'd all sit down. And I pulled out a book. I'm reading a book, and the sergeant comes over. What the F are you doing? I said, I'm reading a book. He says, You're not allowed to read a book. You've got to smoke a cigarette. He <laughs> said, I don't smoke. <laughs> You know, the next day there was a general order on the bulletin board. There will be no reading of books. Oh, good the, Lord. The, the <laughs> so anyway, uh, and they were and they were all like rebels. You know, like it was like it was like I mean, like the end of the world. So, you know, Southerners and you know yeah. from the backwoods and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. <coughs> so, Marini, uh, Private Marini, I go down. And so on, so on, so on. Sit down at the opposite the desk. <coughs> There's a guy, an officer. Got a folder with my name. He says, "You know, you have a very high IQ." See, I, <laughs> I'm flattered. You know, I didn't say. So, well, yeah, okay. You know, I, I had tests before, and you know, they pretty, rated pretty good. And I had gone to Brooklyn Tech, which is a, still to this day considered a very good high school. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, I, I did pretty good. I mean, you know, I flunked one of the math courses, which is, <laughs> it, was, it was almost calculus, is what it was. And I said, and. Uh, no, my piazza, I didn't like it. Anyhow, so he says, you know, he says, we're always looking for, for, for bright young men. He says, uh, how would you like to go to cryptography school? <laughs> so I said, oh, no, 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 no. I want to be a clarinet player. I was promised that, you know, M.O. military, uh, M.O.S., M.O. military <coughs> occupation, military something specialty, 508 or whatever it was. He uh -huh. said, well, he said, you know, it wouldn't be bad. We'd send you to Washington. And et cetera, et cetera, you know. And uh, I said, no, nah, no. Nah. And I always thought, suppose I had said yes. <laughs> That's the, like the figuring out codes and all that. Yeah, kind of yeah. Stuff, I mean, right? I would be, I'd be a CIA guy or something. <laughs> 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 I mean, isn't that funny? I mean, like, you'd sometimes, I, mean, I, mean, I know it was a choice, you know. But yeah, I sure. So that was, I was put into the band and I was stationed <coughs> in Westover Field, Freefield, Mass. Mm -hmm. And uh, Military Air Transport Command, MATS. And they played in the band, and uh, they ran the, uh, the, the you know, the, uh, from Westover, they used to go to, to Germany. I can't think of the name of it. It's still there, an air force, a base. Wiesbaden, and there was the name of an airport. Mm -hmm. And they go back and forth and stuff. And they even had a choice of that. Do they want to go? I should have done that, too. Well, in Germany, after the war, it would be very nice. You know, mm -hmm. I would probably speak some German, you know. Yeah. Probably some chick would have grabbed some German chick for mm -hmm. a while. Well, so anyway, anyhow, I played in the band. I had a wonderful time. Uh, I was there for three years. I made sergeant, and they promised me staff sergeant when I re up. But no, 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 the ten, <laughs> I hated the army. You know. But I was a la band librarian, and uh, I had some decision of what we were going to play with the, with the first with the first sergeant who conducted Sergeant Baraka was a doll. And uh, I remember on my birthday, he knew my birthday. I was invited to his house for dinner, and um, <coughs> there I am. And, and, and I, I, don't, I didn't drink at the time. Maybe I had a beer or something. And he's playing me V-Disc. And he had, he had Lester Young's... Oh. Uh, uh, do 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 right. do what, what is that? Right. Uh, I'll think of yeah, it yeah. in a moment. <laughs> I got rid of him, you know. <laughs> yeah. A 12-inch V-Disc. Right. He played that for me and a couple other things, you know. It was very nice, you know. So uh, I had a very good time. And it's, well, that's when I started to play jazz. They had a, a sort of a big band, and I didn't want to play saxophone. I took, I think, clarinet lessons from the local symphony guy on my own, and uh, I didn't want to play saxophone. I said, you know, I was going to be a legitimate clarinet player. And uh, so and I played in a military band. I became the first clarinetist. There was one guy, uh, an old guy, Rutherford, Al Rutherford, a, a juicer. You know, he had a little mm -hmm. red nose. But he's a marvelous player. I mean, you know, the, the military band, they have 
lot of transcriptions, you know, Verdi and things like that, yeah. where the clarinets play the violin parts. And page after page, wow. you got to read and, you know, and he could do that. But they had a bad sound for solo, so I would get the cadenzas and stuff, you know, mm. uh, which was, I think, that's where I made my first record in the sense that they had a, uh, we, did, we used to do radio programs and somebody c transcribed some of them, you know, and there was one I used to have where I played a, a little written clarinet solo, but it was sort of a jazzy kind of thing. Mm. And so then I started fooling around with improvisation and I was terrible. I played, I played a lot of red notes, you know, out of the chord <laughs> notes. <laughs> a lot of red <laughs> notes. <laughs> uh, uh, and they had a sort of a, uh, you know, I, I played, uh, they had sort of a small combo, but I was interested in antique music, you know, Muskrat Ramble and Louis Armstrong, yeah. Hot Fives and Seven. Not Lester and Leaps In. Lester sort of passed that, but it was yeah. my favorite, you know, I like the old stuff. And so I didn't do much with the dance band. I think I played a little flute, lousy flute, and I uh, had a little solo on something. But uh, so what I did was by that time I'm in New York and I'm starting to play and I got in with a crowd, you know, a crowd of guys at like my age, you know, that maybe a couple of guys from the jazz club in Brooklyn. and. Uh, uh, what happened was uh, there used to be a um, Lindy's or whatever it was called. It was on Broadway in the f high 40s above Times Square. And above that was Nola's, the original Nola's. Nola's. studio. Yeah. They're on 57th if they still are. I, re I rehearsed there with Louis Armstrong. Uh, so anyhow, the uh, um, Nola's studios, you could rent them. You could rent a room. They had a piano. And what the, the deal was, uh, everybody would kick in some money, two, three dollars, whatever it was, and rent a room for an hour or two hours, and have a jam session. And we did that. And it was, you know, really feeling, feeling our way, you know. And uh, uh, a part of that scene was Bob Wilbur. That's where I first met Bob Wilbur. Uh, Bob Wilbur, by the way, looks much better today than he did then. He was sort of skinny, I've pale. I've seen pictures, yeah. Skinny, <laughs> pale, with sort of bad hair, wavy, curly yeah. hair, you know. And just sort of, he, uh, he looked like a nerd, you know. And that was it. But he played wonderfully. He said, uh -huh. Jesus Christ, you scared me to death, you know. And, and I was sort of like, I think in, in retrospect, I was sort of a nature boy, you know, with the red notes and a lot of whales and woo, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Soulful, you know, trying to imitate Johnny Dodd, you know, I mean, that sort of. Uh -huh. uh, I, I didn't. Uh, I liked Benny Goodman, but I didn't aspire to that kind of clarinet. Mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to play. Uh, I'm Johnny Dodge was my hero for a long time. Sidney you know. Bechet? I liked Sidney, yeah. yeah. I liked Sidney a lot, and then I liked later on, <coughs> not long later, I, I fell in love with Omer Sidney, the clarinet player mm -hmm. with Jelly Roll Morton. And yeah. He played with Wilbur de Paris here on 52nd, 52nd Street. So, so uh, um, I, I'm in, then I get into college. And even then, I, I'm, I'm improvising and playing little gigs and stuff. And I, I joined the Phi Mu Alpha Symphonia, you know, a fraternity. And part of the test, the initiation was you had to improvise and have a play at a jam session. <laughs> and oh. Everybody was terrible. They were all classical musicians, you know. And we had this thing, and I'm wailing away. <laughs> and I'm looking, at, what the hell? Where'd you get that? You know, it was uh -huh. sort of completely unexpected. I was uh -huh. going to be a, become a music teacher. Yeah. So, uh, well, where were we? So, so that's how I started to play, you know. Yeah. And, and I think after, <coughs> with the, the the crowd I was with, that was this Irv Kratka and and uh, who was the trumpet player? There was a guy named Jerry Bloomberg, and Jerry was a wonderful player. He was sort of like a, he loved Bunk Johnson, and he could play like Bunk very much, you know. Was, uh, 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 he was quite a good player. Mm -hmm. He maybe, and and you know who maybe was on it? The guy, the short guy. That played trombone, <coughs> some with Louis Big Band. He played with Clarence Williams in the twenties. I can't think of his name. He was on it too. So, so I did that, and that was the very, very first gig, as I said, that that, I, that that paid some money. And then there was a scratching around. There used to be a, a joint in Bridgeport, Connecticut, called the, the Tiptoe Inn, and uh, they paid some sort of I don't know, twenty dollars and, and drinks or whatever, which it <coughs> which didn't interest me much. I was never, I didn't smoke or anything, and, you mm -hmm. know, and then, and uh, uh, the pot was around, you know, but I was not interested in that. I was like, you know, years later, I, I smoked a joint, you know, oh, no. Hmm. 
Uh, uh, so, you know, they, getting into the, the, the musical world such as it was. So we played this gig in Bridgeport, and it was always a trouble, always trouble with it. Was a, it was a union guy would come around and see mm -hmm. him. And, you know, and you, I think he was really interested in, in, the, in, in the tax, you know, which is really all we ever wanted. Mm. But let's see your card, you know. Yeah. And so it was always a big, I think I joined the union. I joined the union when it was on 50, I think 54th and 6th. And uh, I went up, <coughs> and I put music, and I passed. I read it, and you know, I got my mm -hmm. card. And I heard I, other guys who went up there, and uh, uh, they couldn't play at all. Bob Green, the piano player, told me he, they put music, <laughs> piano player, they put music in front of him. He played some Shelly Roll Morton thing. And uh, you're not reading the music. He says, well, this is my interpretation. He got it. I mean, yeah. That, that put it depends. <laughs> <laughs> the audition wasn't that official. Yeah, to show you, you know, the, 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 the corruption of the union in those days. Mm -hmm. That that building on the corner there, on fifty fourth or fifty second and sixth, wherever it was, they could have bought for something like fifty thousand dollars, which would be worth a billion dollars today. You know, mm. they could have had a permanent home, and they didn't buy it. And they oh. just kept renting it. Probably somebody got a kickback. You know, oh. it was really pr pretty rotten. So well, yeah, well. let me sk skip up a little yeah. bit. You you worked for as a, a producer for mm -hmm. RCA and at Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, See what happened. I got out of college, <coughs> and, and, and I played in a college band called uh, uh, called the Red Onions, and we used to play Jimmy Ryan's on Monday nights, alternating with Wilbur de Paris, where Omer Simeon played. And I got to know Omer, and he played an Albert system that ha hardly had any keys on it. It was like I don't know how he played, and so I got him a buffet. Somebody gave me one, and I gave it to him, or he gave me twenty bucks for it or something. It was just. Yeah, I really wanted to horn myself, but I couldn't stand him. You know, he's this yeah. he's great guy playing. And, you know, he, he, he was just so facile. He, he's, he's, he, they'd have the Russian rag. He's playing this thing on this clan, primitive clan. You know. So I loved him. His licks and everything. He was very influential on me. So uh, uh, that's college. And uh, when I graduate, I had a friend also in part of this 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 scene, you know, jam sessions and all that, a guy named Dick Hadlock. And, and Dick is on the West Coast. He studied he studied soprano with Bechet with Sydney in in Brooklyn. And he's got uh, Dick still got a radio program out there in San Francisco for years. Mm -hmm. Very nice guy. He wrote that book, Jazz Masters of the Twenties. You know, oh. you know? uh, Dick is very knowledgeable. He knows almost as much as I do about it. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding, of course, uh, but he's a grand guy. I love him. He's, I mean, he's the sweetest, gentlest, knowledgeable, and uh, he was working at RCA and uh, RCA International, <coughs> and he wanted the, the, they, they were going to expand the department, and they were looking for somebody, and they asked me, "Was I interested?" And I said, "Well, I don't know. Uh, <coughs> I was going to be a music teacher, but I, I student taught for." two semesters and I hated it. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. you know. So I got the job at RCA. And I enjoyed that very much. It was very good. Uh, t it's very funny. There was a thing. It was RCA Victor, okay? It's the name of the American RCA company. Right. They bought the Vi RCA bought Victor. When, when Sarnoff had the big hit with the radios in the late 20s or something, they bought the Victor talking machine company, and it became RCA Victor. And so they, they, they trademarked the dog and the phonograph, you know, and all that. and. And, and they had a deal with, uh, with the English, his master's voice, the same trademark, you know. France, Le Voix de Son Maître, you know, the same mm -hmm. logo. And the, in those days, the government was uh, more efficient on such, such things, and I wonder why. But, the, but the, 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 they, they were notified, RCA, that <coughs> it was a trust. That was a trust, a worldwide trust. You're not illegal. You're not allowed to have a... You know, one one company controlling the whole world. Oh, right. You know the uh -huh. competition. You got to break it up. So Sarnoff decided, for legal reasons, that the they were going to create an RCA label and never mind the Victor and the Dog and Formula, mm -hmm. to show that uh, that they really are competing against the I English uh, Victor talking machine, whatever I you see. know. And, and and so the RCA label was started, and. Uh, Dick and I were in charge of that, and we put together, it was great fun to put together a catalog, you know, like, what, what should we have? We picked up, you know, the, the, uh, I've since seen it in Brian Russ and something, they, they, there's a little tale about it, but, but uh, Benny Moten South, that, da, da, ba, da, ba, da, ba, there was a record made in the 20s, 
And that was continually in RCA's catalog until the end of the 70 RPM era, till mm -hmm. 45. And I think all time bestseller of some kind, you know. So we made sure to put that in the catalog, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it was just great fun, you know, with the record business. Uh, there was our, our, uh, our boss was a guy named uh, Frank McCall. And, and I, I got to talking with Frank McCall. He was a nice guy, you know, smoking a cigar and Harry pulling his hair out. And, uh, <laughs> and he used to work for Frank Walker in the 20s. And Frank Walker was the, the, the recording director at Columbia Records, and he recorded Bessie Smith. Wow. <laughs> And he told me this marvelous story about that Bessie trying to suck up to Frank Walker and, and came in one day in, in Philadelphia with a bicycle and that still had the price on it and she gave it to him to give to his daughter. I'll be darned. <laughs> but can you, can you imagine that, uh, Bessie Smith's story direct, you know? Shoot. And then there was a guy, Jack Linderman, <coughs> who was the head of uh, uh, recording in, in Brazil, in Rio for RCA. And... Uh, I got to talking to him too one time, and he said <coughs> he was an engineer or re in charge of recording in Camden, New Jersey. I said, yeah. I said, you ever encounter Louis Armstrong? He said, yes. I was present at all those, all those, all those oh, RCA wow. Victor sessions, you know. And he said they were done in a little church in Camden. Mm. And he said one day they had a thing that was the, was the fireplace that was blocked up and. Something happened and the, the, the blockage exploded. <coughs> the whole Louis Armstrong session was ruined and the, kind of, the soot came out and covered Jeez. the wall. But I, I treasure those stories. That, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a direct contact, you yeah. know. Yeah. And there was an old gal, Phoebe Snow, uh, who was in charge of purchasing or something. And uh, she was got an invoice on the wall. I said, What's that? She says, Well, that's from the 20s and it's it's a it's a it's a bill from the <coughs> something button and lacquer corporation to RC to to Victor talking machine company because that's what they press the records out of oh lacquer and yeah, yeah. You know, like button lacquer right. or something oh, oh uh-huh and then she told me some stories about Jimmy Rogers you know the the country singer. country guy yeah Very, uh, how much of a junkie he was you know oh. that some of his Records were made in hotel rooms or people holding them up on either side. You know? Oh, gee. Did the, did the um, advent of rock and roll change the amount of work you would get e either as a player or to predict? Well, or now or? it certainly has. I mean, as, as that whole thing developed, uh, I remember when I worked at RCA that uh, there was a guy named Steve Scholes. He was in charge of Pop a and r and there was a, a billboard and all sorts of back and forth, and he signed Elvis Presley for fifty thousand dollars. A lot of money in those days, mm -hmm. like ten million bucks or more. Who knows what, what it would be today? And it was like his ass is on the line. He said he better produce, or well, his job is gone. It was, it was such. And RCA Victor was a conservative company, you know. They, they mm -hmm. were not. And they, of course, you, you know, you know what happened. I guess it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know what happened, Monk was it. Uh, around New York, a big city like this, <coughs> you know, rent was fairly cheap, not like today. You know, the you know, trouble with New York today is there are too many people with too much money, you know, and I, it's just sort of like, in those days, rent was reasonable. A lot of little restaurants, clubs, bars, bars would have a little band. Weekends, if nothing, you know. Or Ryan just started as a bar. They didn't <coughs> <coughs> that went on for years. You know, they, that wasn't supposed to be a, a, a jazz nightclub or anything. Mm -hmm. So th that just sort of all disappeared, you know, and uh, nothing has replaced it. T then TV killed a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, why why go out to the local bar and have a few beers and listen to the band when you can see, you know, the famous names of Milton Berle on television? So I think everything has has uh, mitigated against uh, live jazz. I mean, live jazz was, was associated ad infinitum, ad nauseum, way back uh, with uh, a, a club and drinking right. and dancing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that sort of times have changed, and they're changing very rapidly. Yeah. You know. Right now in New York, there aren't that many jazz clubs. Mm -hmm. And it costs a lot to go to them yeah. oftentimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, tell me how, um, how the gig with Louis Armstrong happened for you. Well... Breaking my life. Um, 
I, you know, I, I knocked around for a while, and you know, it, you get to know people that are similarly inclined. You know, you're kind of jazz. <coughs> and I got to know George Wetling very well. There's a guy named Dick Rath, a trombone player. He was the, the editor of Boating Magazine, a very nice trombone player and a darling guy. He was the greatest guy in the world. He's great, quite a sailor. I used to go out sailing with him. And uh, uh, Dick knew George Wetling, and I lived in the village, and George lived, like, lived a block or two away from me. And somehow we met. And we hit it all. George was a great guy. He was wonderful. George, you know, he was a, he, he, he could get drunk, you know, uh, but he uh, and uh, I heard he could get nasty, but he never did that with me. I mean, mm. he just I was, I was like a, he never had any kids. I guess I was like a son, you know. And I I liked the music, you know, and so he got me together with Condon and Wild Bill and that crowd. And McPartlin, he was a very good friend of Jimmy mm. McPartlin. So I got to play. With, with with Jimmy McPartland and got on the scene, you know, and uh, Jimmy and Mar Marion's still around, a wonderful gal. And uh, I think the first time I made more hundred more than a hundred dollars was it was a hundred fifty dollars with Jimmy McPartland and we had a drive to Cleveland and back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I went on the road with him to it. And it, 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 you know, the, the Dixieland and that old tradition, that old time Chicago jazz, well, it continued in Ohio and Columbus and Pittsburgh, PA, and places like that. They had clubs, and the people were still interested in that kind of music, you know. So, so I got all involved in that, and things went along and went along. I played with this and this one and that one, and I've had I've, I had a, a, this guy named Max a Mayer, uh, a booking agent sort of, and, and he he called me a couple of times, three four times, uh, to play with Red Allen, which is a wonderful experience. Red was but Red was a marvelous guy. I mean, uh, Red was. Uh, up there with Louis Armstrong, mm -hmm. Red Allen was just the natural, beautiful. You listen to those old records, and you get tired of playing Louis all the time. Louis all the time, you know. A uh, uh, little refreshing change is Red mm -hmm. Allen. So, so I played with Red, and, and then there was a, there was a scene called uh, Cyber uh, Casino where Bunk Johnson came. That was I, I went. That was the first live jazz band, almost that I saw. Certainly the first black New Orleans band. Mm -hmm. Bunk Johnson at the Snipers. I was there opening night. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. there are some photographs, and in, 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 uh, in I saw them in Japan in, in some magazine about Bunk Johnson's opening night. And there I am. You, you and one of them? And really? You can see me with my first wife. You know, we're, see, we're still going together. She's sitting on my knee, and we're smiling, listening to Bunk Johnson. It's a marvelous thing. You know? Wow. So uh, I like that band, and I got to know George Lewis rather well. And he hated Bunk Johnson. They all, the whole band hated Bunk. It was like, oh. oh. And, and George Lewis was such a gentle, sweet guy. But uh, what, what I remember, we were in a men's room once and stuff, and Bunk's name came up, and he, he dissed J Bunk Johnson. You wouldn't believe that George could get that nasty with that many of those kind of words. I mean, that's how much he disliked Bunk. Yeah. Well, they were probably thrown together with him yeah. because he had so much hype going on. Rediscovered, you know, working in the fields and, you know, they got yeah, new yeah, teeth. Yeah. Well, Bunk was a marvelous musician. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Bunk used to call that whole band, Jim Robinson and George Lewis and Marrero and what's the name of the piano player, Purnell, his wartime emergency band. Because you know, really? Bunk, Bunk was a great trumpet player. Uh -huh. And I listened to that band and, you know, critically, I loved the whole sound. But after a while, I realized that that uh, uh, Jim Robinson, especially, would play through changes. You know, da da da, but da da da, the chord changes. He said, da 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 da, da. swinging, a nice tone and everything, and exciting. Yeah. But he wasn't making that change. And George Lewis played out of tune. I loved mm -hmm. him. He had a wonderful, nice approach. But, but you know, he wasn't in the league of uh, Omer Simeon or Johnny mm -hmm. Dodger, Bechet. Same idea, but you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> I got I got to, I got to know that band, <coughs> and. Uh, I liked them. As a matter of fact, in, in later years when I first went to New Orleans with Louis Armstrong, uh, I got a word from uh, Alan Jaffe, the guy that ran Preservation Hall, that uh, George wants to see you. And you know, George, when, he, when I first met him in New York, he was a mild guy. I think he was afraid to talk to white people. It was, you know, it was, he came from such a different milieu, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, like like bad days down there, you know. Yeah. And uh, he said, George wants to see you. Isn't that nice? You know, I was just, Touched, you know, like, isn't that nice? That was real, you know. And so we meet him in the quarter somewhere, and we're going to go to a funeral. <coughs> There's George with a nice suit, Panama hat, and a cigarette holder with a cigarette. <laughs> this really? this down-home guy that I remember. Yeah. 
And now he's in his own yeah, element. And I embraced yeah. it. We embraced it. He's smiling. You know, it was all the whole thing. You know, it was so. It was, I never thought I'd. It was with Lewis. He was. I forget what he said, but it was sort of like he was taken with that. You know, oh, well, I had faith in you all the time. I, years later, when I was with Lewis Armstrong, we're in San Francisco. We played uh, the the thing that what's the San Francisco Festival? <coughs> I can't think. Oh, of the fe oh the um, yeah, I can't. It's drawing Sacramento. Out. Sacramento, yeah. Sacramento, Sacramento Jazz yeah. Festival. Yeah, we were there, and Pops was on that, and Pops Foster, and uh, backstage, and he comes up and he grabs me around. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> you know, here I am playing with Louis Armstrong, his old buddy, you know. Yeah. It was wonderful. It was, it was a wonderful wow. moment that way. So anyhow, I, I get into the milieu, <coughs> playing with this guy, that guy, you know. I took lessons with Lenny Giordano for a long time, and you know. I was I, I didn't dislike modern jazz. Uh, I, I just couldn't do it, you know. And so I used to buy all the records and try to keep up to date and, and all that kind of stuff. But I, I realized a, a long time after that I really wasn't interested. My heart wasn't there. And why make myself play something that I, you know, it would be nice to be versatile, you know. But even saxophone, I started much too late. With I, I took, as a matter of fact, uh, Kenny Deverne started the. Kenny Duran was a saxophone player first, mm -hmm. and he played baritone. As a matter of fact, the, no, the Nola Studios. Yes. That, uh, 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 there's a guy named Walter Bow, in, in Brooklyn, uh, a nice guy, plays plays the trumpet. You know, black guy plays the trumpet, and, the, and I've known him a thousand years. He was a friend of Dick Hadlock's, the guy I referred to before, since he was 15 or something. And Walter loves traditional jazz. And when Kenny died, he said, "Hello, remember me?" I said, "Walter." I said, "Yeah." Well, yeah, Walter. He says, when was the first time you met Kenny Deverne? I said, well, Jack Somers house it was place, used to play saxophone and clarinet around New York. Uh, uh, he lived in Queens and his father was wealthy. And I, I was invited to a jam session. I said, there. And I came in and Kenny was playing baritone sax and Jack said, Kenny, I'd like you to meet Joe Moraney, the clarinet player. <laughs> and Kenny was younger, you know, Kenny yeah. was younger than I. So that, I said, no, he said, no, 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 that's not where you met Kenny Deverne. Said it was at Nola Studios, and we were. I was having a session. You know, you were playing. We were playing together, and he said we went upstairs because Ray Sinatra. He was a he's a band leader in Las Vegas. He used to be in here when I was there with Lewis. You know, uh, uh, he was there. A nice cat. I talked to him. He said he was some re distant relative to Frank. You know, he said Ray Sinatra's big band was rehearsing, and I wanted to see what it was. And you came up with me, and who's playing baritone sax but Kenny Deverne. And, and, and Kenny said, was interested in what we were doing, and he came down and played his clarinet. Which is, said, that's where you first went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a long time ago. Wow. But I've got to tell you the truth. Uh, Kenny Deverne uh, uh, was very early on a wonderful clarinet player. He was just, he was, he was God-given natural, you know. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Bob Wilbur is a great, great reed man, too, but I think, uh, uh, I think Kenny's more creative and more. Very creative. More of a fire in him, yeah. you know. Yeah. And the re one of the reasons I like Kenny was, you know, Kenny didn't, didn't particularly care for bebop. He made something out of traditional jazz. It be became an individual thing, which I like, which I try to do. I've mm -hmm. tried to do all my life. And strangely enough, I think I'm coming into it. Uh, uh, I think I'm getting better and better as I get older. And it's not an illusion. I just, I was always such a strong critic of myself and now I have moments long you know that I feel good I feel happy about what I played and I hear it back and I say yeah that ain't bad I'm see it still ain't you know where I want it to be but it's hard you see improvising playing jazz is a very difficult thing it's very difficult to be original and then you have to be your own person you you can copy choruses and do all kinds of things but that doesn't count if clarinet player and I've learned all the Benny Goodman things like Saul Yeager so what <laughs> it's a fool's errand. I was wondering if you'd mention him. It's a fool's errand because uh, 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 somebody does it perfectly already. Huh? You, you, right. you only suffer by the comparison, you know. Yeah. Not yeah. that I'm putting Saul down. I, I admire Saul. I, I remember Saul from when I was a kid, seeing mm -hmm. him play. You know, he, he laughs. He's a New York legend in his own way, not a giant, but you know, in his own way, you know. So, uh, what were we talking about? Well, I'm. I'm curious, how do you explain to someone who, who's only familiar with jazz in the big sense, mm -hmm. well, what's traditional jazz as opposed to modern okay. jazz? Uh, Mark, you've hit, you hit the nail on it. I've been working for years. I've got about 30 chapters in, in the computer about Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And 
it's it's a it's very rarely discussed it's a very big problem of the music and and uh, it, it doesn't get discussed much what is jazz and it's a very difficult subject and how do you define what is jazz and I've tried well it's a swing well no a lot of music swings uh, it's got soul whatever a lot of music has got soul uh, it's got to have it's, I, I think it's got to be have a, a, a strong touch of the blues, some of the bend the notes. It can't be. Uh, I think Buddy DeFranco, for instance, has warmed up a lot. I, uh, mm. About ten years ago, I heard somebody say, "Hey, that's really." I, he, I always thought he was phenomenal. Yeah. You know? But but the, the, I didn't get much warmth out of him. This was kind of nice. I said, "Really?" <laughs> and I was so pleased. Number one, I was pleased that I liked it. You know? Yeah. Because I I'm very I'm very tough. I mean, uh, people ask me, "Do you like jazz? What, something about jazz? What do you like?" You know, uh, you like jazz? And I said, no, I don't like jazz, which is more true than the other that I like jazz. Because most stuff that passes for jazz today, I do not care for. I don't like it. it and they got a perfect right. They got a right to play them blues, but it doesn't interest me. Okay, so now, so it boils down to what is jazz? I don't know, it's got to have some blue notes. It's got to swing. It's got to be original. It helps if it's original. Uh, it's sort of like generally, it's got to be in a certain bag, you know what I mean? A certain form, it's bebop or whatever, however, but, but it's very hard to define. And I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it, and for me, jazz is the music that Louis Armstrong plays. And it's very simple, you can understand, it, you know, when I say that, you know what I'm talking about, don't mm -hmm. you? I do until, it's, but, but Louis Armstrong played a lot of music sort of after the 20s and 30s mm -hmm. also. It may not have been really jazz. He jazzed it up. Well, is music jazzing it up? What is jazz? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Playing, the, you know, it, jazz is a feeling. It can be, it, you can play the straight metal. Now, now, Louis Armstrong, you know, he was the same, he was the same man when he died as he was when he was young. You know, there was always that, that thing, that flame in him never died. And he could play the straight melody and melt your heart. And that's jazz. Mm -hmm. Now you mm -hmm. can tell the difference between somebody very square and, and somebody swinging, you know. Yeah. You I know. have a, I have a, a brief piece here uh -huh. uh, of Oh yes. <laughs> very brief. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's wonderful, You're, wonderful. Remember that session? Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. amazed at how many records are out that there. Was a, that was a made up 57th Street here. Really? With with uh, uh, the guy that did Commodore Records, the A&R guy. I can't think of his name. Oh, Brower? No, 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 it wasn't Grower. It was uh, um, the famous. He was the a and R Decca. He recorded Billy Holiday and everything. Oh, Avakian? No. Oh, gee. He had Commodore Music Shop on 42nd Street and the Commodore label. Oh, yeah. I this is like Billy Crystal's uncle. Yeah, that's right. 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 Jesus, isn't that terrible? Oh. Well, years ago, I was so sharp, and now yeah. I get confessed. Yeah. So, so. Well, anyhow, the point is uh, 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 he never lost it, Louis Armstrong. And, and he, you know, and, uh, this, this gets into the definition very much so. You, could, you made a good point there. He said, well, hello, Dolly Time is, you know. It, it's certainly not as interesting as that. Uh, you know, starting with some barbecue or potato head blues, you know, whereas the mm -hmm. naked, 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 naked creativity, mm -hmm. the situation was, 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 was completely different. But he, he never lost his fire. He always shows something. And, and what it happens is, is uh, like Roy Eldridge. Now I, play, I ended up playing at Ryan's with Roy Eldridge. I played with Roy for 10, 11 years. And at the same time, I was playing with Louis Armstrong. Would you believe that? Wow. Me, the immigrant son. You look at me, <laughs> old Ofe Joe. <laughs> you know, and I, and I got involved between them. It was the mm. deepest, the mm. deepest S H I T you ever. You yeah. Know? And and Zudi Singleton was involved in it. You know, I got Zudi and Louis Armstrong together when Zudi had a stroke. Mm. I told Louis, oh, oh, and I remember it was a. He went to see Zudi, and they hadn't been together in years and years. You know, it was like. Pops is putting down to, oh, he can't play drums with us, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, he went, he went uh, to visit Judy in the, the Woodburn Hotel over here. 
And I said, yes, yes. And, you know, and Judy had, well, Judy had a lot of fans, you know. He had, I think, uh, 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 Ahmed Erdogan liked him, and Nesui Erdogan, Ahmed had just died, you know. Yeah. And uh, he said, if you, need, if you need anything, he said, you call me. Don't call your white friends. <laughs> <laughs> your rich white friends. <laughs> ah. That's a marvelous story about, and, and, you know, Lewis was, he was a saint. I would, it was the biggest thing in my life. You know, I'm going to get cheery. Yeah. Uh, I mean it too. He was just a wonderful guy. And he could be a bastard. And he could be a, oh, a terrible. He could, he could hurt you so badly and nobody in the world could do that. You know, it, it was like, you know, mm. uh, <clears throat> but anyhow, the point is, uh, uh, I liked him. Yeah. He liked me. And, and the thing is, I never yet, and I've, you know, I've talked to people for a hundred years you ever see Louis, and uh, you know, you, you hear the most interesting things, you know. And most everybody that got to know him or knew him a little, old, uh, he, Louis was his best friend. You know, the, Louis had this quality, Louis, as you call him, so, had this quality. Uh, he was very gregarious and very good with people, and he liked people. And he would really go out of his way, and you know, you would think, well, the big man doesn't have time for that. But he did make time. And a lot of people thought, that, that he was a much better friend than he was. Not that he wasn't a friend, but he had this quality sure. that he exuded. You know, he felt like he was. And so when I say, I include myself. So when I say this, I say maybe I'm, but maybe I'm. Full. But he was awfully nice. To me. What uh, is Louis Louis's light bulb? Oh yeah. Does yeah, this that, mean something? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, I, I took my kids, my my my, my second wife. And, and the two kids, Adrian and Paul, and Paul was a little one. And we took him down to Atlantic City. We were playing there, and uh, they had to meet Louis Armstrong. So they came up on the stage, you know, back, took him backstage. And, and uh, my daughter, nice to meet you, Mr. Armstrong. She's the older one. She was very cute and darling. And his little Paul, he must have been five or something like that. <laughs> and pops, yeah! <laughs> and Paul puts out his left hand, because <laughs> he was so ambiguous, was he left or right hand? He puts out his left hand, and pops breaks up laughing, and he puts out his left hand, too, you know. And he liked the kid, you know. Mm -hmm. And they met him later on. <coughs> we were in, in Reno once at Warmler's store. We were in Reno, and we had made some records with pops. And uh, he had a little phonograph. He always traveled with the phonograph. Yeah. And, 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 and so the demos of the records. And he called me on the phone. He said, one of the same motel. He said, you want to hear the records? You we met? He said, yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, I'll send up Paul, my son. And, I mean, you know, and, and, and let's put it this way. He didn't call everybody in the band. Do you want to hear the, mm. you know I mean? It was like, it was like, I, it was like. so I sent Paul up and God, 45 minutes. What happened to me? Did he get lost? I'm starting to get nervous. And in walks Paul with the phonograph record. Paul, where are we? I said, oh, he says, I went up and the, the door was a little open. I knocked on the door and uh, he let me in. And he was sitting on the bed with his trumpet, <laughs> tooting, you know. So he called me in and he, 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 he said, you like the trumpet? And Paul said, yeah, well, what it comes. Conversation ensued. And then he said, I sat on the bed next to him. He said, you want to blow it? <laughs> And you know, and the old man fell in love with my son. You know, you oh, never had any gee. kids. You know what yeah. I mean? So I mean, I remember a couple of nights in Reno. I mean, your pops was kind of bombed. <coughs> We're at the blackjack table, and he starts does a monologue on my son, on me and my son. Boy, he's got Joe Moraney, my clarinet man. Has he's got a son? You ought to see that little sucker. Whatever, however, it was darling. You know what I mean? So anyhow, he impressed Paul, mm. and Paul drew my daughter's <coughs> draws in there. They're both very artistic. They draw. <coughs> I think my daughter's better, but my son's pretty good. And uh, for years, Paul drew a head with teeth, a big smile. It was obviously Pops. And at the time, I didn't pick up on it, you know. It's his big smile, and he called it Louis Lightbulb. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like when Pops is around, the light yeah. goes on, you know. Yeah. And it was so darling, you know. That's what Louis Lightbulb Gee, started. that's a neat story. <laughs> well, you said in a, a little note you wrote to me, you said, uh, as far as your own career right now you said thank God for Europe yeah you go over there a lot yeah, yeah. <coughs> I mean you're there jazz not everywhere but <coughs> generally jazz is more it's more culture considered more more of a cultural thing you know more art and and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, they, I, George Bernard Shaw or somebody said yeah, that that uh, you know, if you if you go to f if you travel and go to foreign countries, that's the only time you get to know your own country. You mm. know, and and 
and, and, and America, I, I'm an American, I love America, I was born here, went to school here, you know. Uh, I served in the armed forces here, as I said before. But there's an awful lot of, uh, America's not perfect, you know. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of traits America has, and which is so big, you know, that uh, it, it, we don't take criticism easily. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And there are many aspects. So, so in Europe, uh, 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 I think jazz is getting less there, too. This year, frankly, I think all of the rock has taken over. Yeah. But 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 I find that I'm more appreciated. I get more work, uh, and, and and the most surprising people. I'm walk walk down a small street in Hungary or something, and everybody knows in the street mm. who I am. You That's know? neat. And it, it's not. I don't know what that is, but but yeah. but it it it, it's a, it makes you feel good, you know. Yeah. And I'm not expecting people to stop on the street. Who am I? I don't know. Clarinet right. player. You know. But. Uh, uh, <coughs> It's it's a I get a much better feeling out of Europe being a musician there. You expressed some feelings about jazz education before we started today. Jazz what? Jazz, jazz education. Oh yes. <laughs> well, well. Uh, 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 I I don't think there's anything wrong with somebody uh, uh, going to conservatory or uh, to study music to st and to study jazz. But I've never yet met a program. I mean, what, uh, just consider what it, what they produce. They produce people that know all about Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker and Post and everything like that. And I guess some courses they treat history, but uh, forget it, you know. And then they all <coughs> play the latest thing. And, oh, but about definition of the jazz. It, it, it's got to have freedom, yeah, you know. And and I I like the idea of modern jazz and what they produce, but I don't actually like the music, mm -hmm. you know. It, it, it's very, it's it's a, a very curious thing. As I said before, if somebody just asked me, "Do I like jazz?" I say no because I know what they're thinking of, and I don't like it. Ah. And, and let's put it this way: jazz is so compartmentalized. You know, there are so many aspects, and 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 America's got this bad history of antagonism between between the styles of jazz. Europe, no. In Norway, I went to a party celebrating somebody's 30th anniversary in the business. And all the jazz musicians were there, the modern ones, the beboppers. They were all there, and they gave them an award, somebody an award, and they all had a drink and had a meal. You know, that's not very un-American. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry to say it. You know, it doesn't yeah. especially in New York, they just they just uh, they just uh, uh, dice and slice each other. You know, yeah. maybe because work is so scarce. You know? Yeah. Did you ever have any issues with um, traveling in an integrated group when you were with Louis? No, some back to you. The jazz know. education we were talking oh, yeah, about. Yeah. Oh, oh, I know. I was just wondering about when you traveled with, with Lewis, so that the group was integrated, if it ever became an issue traveling anywhere. You mean the fact that he was black or it was a In, mixed band? Yes, it was a mixed band. No. That, that was by, the, by the time I was there, I heard him refer. He, he, yeah, he meet some, some of his old buddies would come up. And there was one he talking about. Yeah, I had $2,000 in my pocket. He said, I have no place to sleep or eat or anything, mm. you know. So, so I, I, I th th that came up, but but at, at art, you know, art actually. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, it's been really fascinating. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I, I enjoyed talking to you, and I, I wish you the best of luck. And uh, I need a miracle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're going back overseas soon. You have something scheduled. Ah, I think in June I got something. Yeah. Uh, there's a, an annual Louis Armstrong Festival. Right. This is the third annual. I know. see. And I'm sure the jovial MC in Hungary. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah. For okay. Yeah, Ro. Right. <laughs> Monk Ro is nice talking. Hope you got enough. <laughs>